I'm the PE Division of Indian Work. It's been a while since they got LLC. Hello, everybody. My name is Derek. I'm from the Milwaukee area. I'm like the band Ojibwe. I'm Bear Clan. I now live here in Minneapolis and working at the Division of Indian Work as the Nutrition Program Coordinator. Over there, I cook programs for all the programs there and do work around traditional foods and try to just provide healthy, culturally appropriate foods for all the programs that we serve to. And then I have a personal business called We Snig LLC, where I do catering, food demos, teaching classes, and just doing engagement around food, creating uh, do cultural exchange classrooms, hoping to facilitate some trips as well, domestically and internationally. And then we also create some educational resources. So for example, I made like create some videos. Um, the other weekend I was up at Red Cliff working with some elders and they're sharing their stories from food growing up in Red Cliff and also just other type of resources like um, indigenous food pantry. It's like a little PDF where you can take it to your local grocery store or co-op and try to decolonize your pantry at home and kind of show us different substitutes. For example, maybe instead of buying beef, you can look for you get bison or instead of chicken, maybe duck, look for different nuts around the store that are indigenous to the North American continents. So um, a lot of different food work, food sovereignty is a really big thing for me. And uh, me, you, uh, you guys. Hope and Asian cousin of Majaganashima win. We cannot do them, Taiwan is going to get in and do Jaba. That no key me on my dream of wild health thing, Ujugi no So I've been working at Dream Wild Health for 14 summers. I'm going on my 15th year now, and I've had the pleasure of working with this wonderful young man. And uh, I love to go out in the woods and see what's out there and what all the beautiful gifts from they, they say. Uh, Mani do nigan, uh, mani do giti o gitigani from the spirits garden. If you want to say nig, uh, nigani, will it's leading us, they're leading us into our food ways. Um, and uh, I was really happy that I get an opportunity to be here tonight and speak about some of our foods from some of the old foods and how they're prepared and looking at foods in a new way. I feel like um, with things changing worldwide, that we, we're being forced to look at food in a new way and to be reminded that there's so much to be grateful for today, that we have food and that we have things to be grateful for. And we've had these beautiful gifts for so, so long. Yeah, so today we're gonna to be making a pretty simple, healthy, nutritious recipe, we're doing some wild rice portage. And so right now I got some wild rice in the pot. This is hand harvested wild rice. And I did uh, one cup of wild rice to two cups of water. And we brought it up to a boil and then reduced it down to a simmer. And we're just letting this simmer until all the water evaporates. And at that time, the rice should be cooked. And we also hope brought a whole bunch of different wild rice varieties. We're going to be showing that off, looking at it, and talking about the whole process of wild rice from going out and harvesting it to actually processing it and it's a very big rigorous task it's a lot of a lot of work to do this and it's uh, really excited to be here with hope today and talk about these things it's an honor um in in our old way and the same way that many people still practice before you receive these gifts uh from Manidu Maganazid from the leading spirit from the creator you do you week home day, you do a feast to thank all the living beings that are just as alive as we are. You'd say, Niji Bimandazik, our fellow living beings. So you put up a feast before anybody goes out and harvests rice. You invite those people that are going to come and, and be with you and be in that practice of building community through food. So when you have like a rice in camp and people come together, you we konge and we say we konge da. Let's come together and have a feast to honor that rice, to honor what's going to go on here while we thank that rice for this gift. Um, one of the things I remember hearing was when you don't thank your elders, they leave because they don't know that you're grateful that they're there. 
So um, this is a reminder to always be thankful. So the first thing you, you do is you have a feast and you do a thank you. So you thank the spirit of the rice, you thank all the beings that are around you, and you thank your people that are going to go out. Back in the day, there would always be a rice boss, and some of our reservations still have rice bosses. Uh, back of what I've always heard, it was usually grandmas. The women were watching over the plants, and the men were out watching over the meats. So the grandmas would let you know, is the rice ready? So people would be watching, you start looking around July for where is the rice? What does it look like? Is it coming up? Has it stood up yet? So um, I know for me, I, I do that through the state of Minnesota this year. You know, we had a lot of challenges because of flooding with climate change to the north and drought to the south. So I went up into Canada to see, could I see any rice? And I went from like Fort Francis over to Thunder Bay and saw no rice. And that was because of the water levels were so high. The rice is really affected by water change, water level changes. So um, we didn't have it to the north of us much. There's certain areas where the water levels stay the same. So that's where you're going to see like if there's springs, if there's rivers near springs or there's areas where the waters come together or you might see a higher amount of water stability, then you might have more wild rice. So um, that's something that you look for is you check for where are the wild rice is coming up, where's it coming up and where can you gather it? So that's the first part. We start doing that. I start looking in July. <laughs> I was like, is it coming up? Where is it? You know. So then you get an idea about where you might want to go to gather your rice. So today, yeah, um, this is in memory of a dear one. There was an elder named Terry Brightnose in the 70s. She had a rice shop on Franklin Avenue where NAC Clinic, the Native American Community Clinic is now. And she would have rice from all the different tribes here in Minnesota that went ricing. People would bring them to her and she would have them in shelves that would say where that rice was from. So if you wanted your rice from a specific place, suppose that that's where you were enrolled as a tribal member, or maybe you had a, you liked the texture or the, the flavor of a certain rice, that's where you might go. So today, I thought I'd show a little bit about the differences between the wild rice. So um, it's kind of interesting, you can tell by the thicknesses, and the colors of the rice, the differences. Now, there is a big difference between paddy rice, and this right here is paddy rice. It's really dark. Yep. Now, to me, I never have much luck with, luck with paddy rice. And what that means is it's been uh, grown in a manufactured paddy that was shoveled out and the water levels were maintained. Some people don't mind using patty rice. It's, you have to soak it a lot longer, boil it a lot longer. And for me, I'm always looking for it to puff and curl. So um, sometimes you might not ever get that with patty rice because it's really tough. Now you wanna remember that whatever that plant lives in, it takes in the nutrition from the soil. So if that patty rice keeps getting the soil keeps getting scummed off, you know, or else they're not putting the nutrition back in to um, revitalizing the soil where the plants grow, then you know you're not gonna get as much nutrition from the rice. That's why when you, we were always told when I was young, go for the Oasia, go for the Oasia. Those are the wild ones. The Awakanog are the enslaved ones or the domesticated ones that we've made relationships with. I'm uh speak my truth, I'm not the biggest fan of patty rice. Um, for those that don't know, this is actually made by the University of Minnesota. Um, this is cultivated, it's not wild at all, and it's a whole different process of how it's made. It doesn't, it doesn't go through all the steps these other hand harvested wild rice go through. Um, like this is not wood fired parched, so it loses a lot of flavor. A lot of wild rice, that's true wild rice, has a nice smoky flavor to it, and this is kind of plain to me. And uh, it's also really dark in color because it's like leached and lied. And that's how it kind of gets to that process. It's 
it's kind of like fast tracking the process to reach the final state. And this is, this is not true. You'll see it with different with different rices. So when when you start to look at more of the actual wild wild rice that was hand processed, this particular rice here is from Battle River up near the Canadian border. So sometimes river rice, not always, but sometimes river rice is going to be skinnier and a little lighter. Now that might be something you want. You know that might be something you're like, oh, this is something that I'm I want for my recipes. So this is. Battle River rice. This right here is from Leech Lake around the Minnesota Island in Leech Lake. So it's a little fatter. You'll see a little bit of more of the modeling on the rice. You'll see some green in there. You'll see some darker browns in there. So a little bit more of the different colors. This right here is from the upper Mississippi River. Now you're going to say, how come that looks so pink? So sometimes when people uh, use a processor for rice, they'll put their rice in when they're when they're tumbling it to get the chaff off. And when the when they're tumbled heavily, you'll see that a lot of the browns and the greens don't appear in the rice. So um, you'll see examples of that too. This I'm real proud of. One of our students went with us at Drew Wild Health Rising, and then he took it on himself to go out and get his own rice, and he brought it back to us. So me guichwate egiwatech kom gichigero o we 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 ojituro. So thank you for making this egiwatech kom. This is net lake rice. So you'll see it's a little fatter and has much more modeling. See the browns and the greens in there. Those are hand parts hand parched rice. What you might want to do is start getting a hold of different reservations and saying, hey, how did it go this year? Can you recommend a ricer, you know, picking up rice? I know, I know Derek had gotten a hold of a, a fellow that did ricing, so he's been able to get rice this year. Um, but in a lot of places, it wasn't easy to get rice. So you can't really blame the people if you're like, oh my gosh, rice is going to be expensive this year. Um, it's because of, you know, the differences in climate. Um, but you can't blame the processors because the processors are doing the best they can. This is something I really want to show. Um, for years, I was watching this particular, and you can see it's still in the chaff. It's just dried. This is a, a southern subspecies of wild rice that was growing down in Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin. And I was watching it for a long time because it was super, super tall. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to express this, but you can see the differences between the very thin little rice kernels here and some of the fatter rice kernels. So these thinner rice kernels right here were from this really, really tall wild rice. It was about 13 feet tall. 13 feet tall. So um, here's the interesting part though. That rice is such a gift. It's been coming up the Mississippi River. It's been coming up and it's ended up coming to our Dakota communities. And some of our Dakota communities have been able to rice for the first time in a long, long time. And even though that rice is that tall, you can still get rice. And it might be skinny, but it's still rice. So it's a beautiful gift. And I know that the, the animals, the, the swans, the ducks, the geese, the moose eat rice, the deer eat rice, the muskrats eat rice. Anytime you're able to have the rice come back, you're gonna have other life forms come back with them. Yeah. So it's a huge gift. And that's a very important teaching to protect our waterways because this plant is very finicky and it can pollution, runoff can really affect the plant and it affects communities in a whole. Not only us on Schnabeg, we use this as a way of life, we find it in all of our ceremonies mostly. A lot of ceremony foods like berries, fish, wild rice, and maybe some type of meats. And a lot of communities are having a hard time getting this because it hasn't been growing well due to climate change and pollution. And once when the rice goes, once when our plant relatives go, then we lose our, our four-legged ones, our water beings, our winged ones, and then we're the next to go. So it's very important to 
protect our water, protect our land so that we can all live healthy in a sustainable way. I wanted to do a quick blurb for uh, from out in Derek's part of the world. This is uh, Glyphwick, uh, Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission. They do studies on the vulnerability of rice. Um, and I'm really proud of the tribes over there in Wisconsin, like over at Bad River and Ashland. So you can see that there is a lot of uh, challenge with the rice and you can see how it's changing if you want to look at great lakes indian fish and wildlife commission for people who are wanting to rice in wisconsin you have to uh, go to this site the great lakes indian fish and wildlife commission to apply to rice because um, they really are keeping an eye on what's going on we've been a little bit more fortunate in minnesota but uh i guess you might say the native communities are sort of on alert, high alert for what's going on with the plants, the animals, the foods, because we've done it for so long, for so many generations. So we're paying attention to what's happening on a broader scale. Yeah, so this wild race is just about done. So I don't know if we want to take a little pause from the wild race talk and maybe do a little bit of cooking. Sure. Yeah, so like I said, I just brought one cup of wild rice into the pot, two cups of water, and then I salted it. Uh, you want it to be pretty salty, but obviously not too salty, just maybe a tablespoon or so. And then we're just going to go right in with some, some nut milk. I guess you can really use any type of milk. I like to use nut milk because we don't really do too well with dairy. Dairy wasn't really found in our diet. Maybe we get some like turkey eggs or some herringole <laughs> eggs if we got lucky. So I'm just putting enough just to cover the wild rice. And then I'm going to add some seasonings. So we got some uh, Zinze Bakud Wabu, which is some maple syrup. We're going to put a couple tablespoons in there. And then I'm also going to use some allspice. So allspice is found from the allspice bush and has some berries. This is derives from the berry. Um, it's kind of a unique flavor. The way I would describe it is like a mix between cloves and cinnamon. Yes, uh, a friend of mine from um, the uh, Native News Online just sent me some twigs and leaves that are much more mild than the berries but uh, the twigs and leaves have some of the flavor. The berries are out east and to the south. We don't have it growing in Minnesota, but it does have, it's a, it's a indigenous plant and it has some delicious of those spicy flavors. So when you saw that, that Derek was using the maple syrup, we do have different kinds of syrups as well. So people are starting to think about, well, what other kinds of syrups might you have? You might start looking at your own property and say, hey, I have silver maple trees. I have box elder trees, which are a type of maple. Those are tappable and you can certainly tap those and get your own syrup. Maybe you've noticed that you have birch trees. Birch trees make a beautiful syrup. Of course, they have a, a smaller contact of sugar than say a maple sugar. They're the ones that have the highest level of sugar content. Say you have black walnut trees, you can tap your black walnut trees and also make a walnut syrup. So the, these are some things to think about as we get into different times. It's a good thing to start thinking about how do I become more food aware? How do I experience and express my own food sovereignty? Well, certainly watching what's growing in your yard and certainly doing some of those kinds of uh, uh, being responsible by using what's available to you makes it a little bit easier and gives you an idea of things to be grateful for. And tapping trees is such a fun activity to do with the youth as well. Yes. And you just you set them up, you come back later and you got a whole bunch of sap and then you can boil it down and make syrup. Um, each different tree has a different level of sap to syrup ratio. It usually takes like 40 gallons of sap to make one gallon of syrup. So it's it it can, a lot of it can, down. It can be as much as a hundred gallons yeah. of sap for one gallon. It can be, it depending on the winter 
And some of you also noticed if you were tree tappers this year in this neck of the woods, partially you know, up to Mille Lacs, down to the Dakota communities, over to partway into Wisconsin, we had our trees tapped and waited a whole month before the trees were able to give their sap. And so then their sap bearing season was really short, a little bit more than a week. I think some people had like 10 days um, where this, the trees were able to give their sap. And that's because again of the climate changes that are happening. And I do know a lot of people that don't even boil it down. They just drink the sap, oh. save the sap and just drink it at home. That's considered a medicine because yeah, it has that iron content. It has those things in there that are the direct gift of the tree. Um, there's traditional legends, they're called the Adizukanag. Um, now the Adizukanag will tell about like when humans don't do their thank yous or they take things for granted that those things get taken away. So I can't tell those Adizukanag right now because there's no snow on the ground. You gotta wait till there's snow on the ground. But um, there is one about how humans would sit underneath the trees and just let it run into their mouths when, when, uh, when they weren't being appreciative for that gift. So um, one of those, those stories sometimes are reminders about like when you show your gratitude, when you show that we as humans, we're not the first ones, we're the last ones here. So those elders, those plants, those trees, those insects, those animals, they were all here before us. And we're supposed to be watching them to see how to survive. Yeah, so um, I just got a little stirring stick and you can give it a taste test and adjust to however you like it. I can just tell by the smell. Um, I, got a, I got a good sniff around me that this is just how I like it. So if you have like a stick blender, you can just blend it in right now, just blend it all up. I got a blender with me here today. So I'm gonna put it in the blender and put it at a high speed and bring it to the consistency that I like. So obviously if you want it to be more thick, you put in less milk, but if you want it to be uh, a little bit more runny, you can put in more milk. I can say that Derek spoiled me this week. I already, I already had a chance to taste this recipe for his uh, wild rice. I think he called it wild rice porridge. Yep. So, oh my gosh, it's so delicious. It's a very simple recipe, very nutritious. Uh, wild rice, great gift. Not only feeds us nourishly, but feeds us spiritually. Um, has very high levels of carbohydrates and protein, which is just what you need in the winter months. Mm. You know, this is a perfect crop because it stores all winter and you just have, it's a really reliable thing you can find mm. in someone's home. And then also has very nice uh, minerals in there, like it's good in iron and has vitamin B in there. So it's it's like a power food. It's like a wonder food, you know. Vitamin B too. So we're just gonna blend this up. And now we're going to find a good serving bowl to put this in. Another beautiful thing about rice is you don't have to worry about it going bad. I heard that they found some old, old caches of rice and that rice is still good. Mm -hmm. It's still food. One of the challenges always was how do you keep the rice from like if you're you're sharing it some with the animals, but you want to still have some to make it through the winter. So um, I want to lift up even though we were we were always thinking about you've got to have enough rice if you're going to have it every day which some of those elders do some of the elders up north that i know still have wild rice every single day and it, then it depends do you want to have wild rice and duck do you have wild rice and deer meat do you have wild rice and moose meat that's up to you but there's all sorts of different things you can do with wild rice so why not you know have it in so many different manners yeah, you can, like Copa was saying, you can use wild rice in so many different ways. You can cook it plain and just have it as is. And while having it plain, you can, you can make it into like a salad. You can just put butter in there. You can sweeten it up with maple syrup, add blueberries. 
I also like using it as a filler. So like I said, using it, put, add it to a salad, make that mix in some quinoa as well. Uh, it goes good. You can add it to like a burger, like a black bean burger, add some wild rice and quinoa, uh, just give it a little bit more thickness and layers. And there's just so much things you can do and you can blend it up, make wild rice portage. You can puff it up like popcorn in a way. And mm -hmm. add it as like a garnish to desserts or just eat it as like a nice little snack, like a trail mix. So the possibilities are endless when you're cooking with wild rice. It's such a unique plant and it's so fun to experiment in the kitchen. It's, it's, it's really a gift. So this is the wild rice portage. I'll uh, bring it around so you can get a closer look. So it's a really nice color and it has like that oatmeal consistency. I'm trying to move it around a little bit to show that. It's a little thick, but just pretty much perfect. Um, and then you can garnish it with whatever you like. Any type of seed, any type of dried fruit. Today I brought some of my favorites. Um, this is usually my go-to when I make this. Some dried cranberries and some pecans. I just like the flavor of those going together. Some people don't realize that cranberries are uniquely indigenous. Um, Non-native folks had never heard of such a thing. Some people call them cranberries. And here in Minnesota, we have both the low bush cranberries where the cranberry bogs, where tribal people would gather cranberries and then sell them to the newcomers. They had never seen them. And they're like, wow, these tart berries are interesting. So particularly the low bush cranberries, but we also have the, the high bush cranberries. Now they both, both the upper, the high bush and the low bush cranberries, they're ready right now. And they do particularly well after they freeze, they sweeten up. So um, I did go picking both high bush and low bush cranberries this season. Um, of course, they too have to have a fairly uh, stable water condition. So the only place where I could find the low bush cranberries is where they had regular peat moss like that wasn't overwatered or underwatered. Um, again, there are uh, most cranberries in, this, in the United States now will be the, um, uh, the cranberries that are in a cultivated bog. So you'll see like they aren't in the wild like most like back in the day, the cranberries were all in the wild. So they're smaller, a little bit more tart, but just as delicious. And then the high bush cranberries are uh, a type of viburnum. And I was just picking some this weekend. You'll see them, they have a flat round seed on the inside, but they're also very tasty. Do you know if pecans are native? Pecans are not, but the interesting part is the word pecan is. Bagan is nut in Ojibwe. So baganug would be nuts, like uh, hazelnuts are native, hickory nuts are native, um, black walnuts are native. So some of those nuts, like the bitter hickory nut or the shag bark hickory nut, the pig, pig nut is a hickory nut. So those are all indigenous nuts that you would call different kinds of baganug. So bagan is pecan is from the Ojibwe for nut. Oh, did you mention hazelnuts? Yes, hazelnuts. Um, one of the things we used, we used to always do with Drill Old Health is we would have a taste off where they would taste the domesticated hazelnuts versus the wild hazelnuts to see, well, which one do you like better? Well, you know, almost always the ones in the wild are going to be smaller, but they're going to have that intense flavor. So I know when I was little, my mom and my sister and I would go out and we'd go picking hazelnuts and then we'd sit around together and crack hazelnuts. Now here in Minnesota, we have two different kinds of hazelnuts. We have the regular American, column American hazelnut uh, that you can, they have like little leafy outsides where you can peel them open and then the hard hazelnut is in the inside or you have beach hazelnuts and those are to the north. And uh, my dear friend, Mary Moose, she used to say, throw them in the fire. And I'm like, why would you do that? I was used to the American hazelnuts, but the beet hazelnuts, they can be really prickery when you grab them and those little hairs can stick into you. So you want to burn off those hairs if you're going to go gathering them. Yeah, it's, just speaking of all that, it kind of shows why native foods are so expensive because it's 
so rigorous to not only harvest them, but to process them. And that kind of reminds me of that fir oak acorn the tree over one. at uh, the day Makaska. So maybe a couple months ago, I went to go harvest some fir oak acorns and then biked over there one weekend. And well, Hope told me about this tree that was under stress. They're doing construction at this fir oak acorn tree and it just wanted to share its life, its gift to all of us. So it started shedding its acorns early. So I went over there one weekend, harvested a whole bunch of acorns by myself, it just took a while. And then I come home with a big bag of acorns. I'm like, oh my gosh, now I got to crack them all open. This is going to take forever. But anyways, a week later, we go back again with Hope and a couple of our friends, Felicia and Kateri, and we were able to harvest a whole bunch real quick. We went back to DIW, Division of Indian Work, and we just started cracking them. Yeah. And we just had fun conversation. We were able to share stories. We were able to pull out the little worms and dare each other to eat them. <laughs> and it just makes a lot of sense to do this stuff in community because mm. it's well, not only faster, it's more efficient. You get to build friends and mm. people kind of get feel like they have a place where they fit in and uh, you know, have like a, it just makes sense to do these things in the community. I'm so grateful that Derek's bringing that up because that's been coming up a lot. Uh, we've been hearing a lot about what they call environmental anxiety and depression, especially with teenagers. And one of the things you see when you do this wild gathering that a person is a whole person, not just their mind or not just their connection with their handheld device. So those aspects of a person, our mind, body, soul, and spirit. And you notice that that's the four chunks of the medicine wheel, those four divisions. Now, all of us need to honor all four of those divisions. So when you're out there and you're gathering your rice, it's gonna be hard work. It's gonna be physical work. You have to keep moving. You have to keep your body in good shape. You have to feed it in a nutritious manner. So you honor that physical spot. You'll honor the spiritual spot because you're out there thanking the creator and you're thanking the spirit of the rice. You're thanking the Adizutanum that watch over the water world. And you're there. So you're looking at your physical, your spiritual, you're looking at your emotional because it's a team effort. You know, I'm going to be able to survive a lot longer if I'm working in a tribal way. If I'm thinking I'm working with my friends, my family, we're working together. We're working together with our, our plant family our animal family, we're not in opposition. We have to work together or we're not gonna make it. So in an emotional way, we're building emotional support. And of course, mental. So when I see Derek here and I know I can bring him any kind of food and he's gonna chef it up and make it fun and interesting. I don't have that ability. I don't have that mental capacity to chef like that, but he does. So we always want to remember that absolutely every single one of us, whether we're a human or a plant, no such thing as a weed. Everything has a gift. Every insect has a gift. Every animal has a gift. Every living being has a gift. So what our job is, is just to accelerate and honor and elevate our own gifts, but look for the gifts in all the other Niji Bimadizi, the other fellow living beings. So uh, when you try to live in that whole circle and not just one way, you're gonna see that that's how our human bodies were designed. We're not designed to be doing this all day long and we can't, we physically won't make it if we try to do that. I think about the beaver a lot. The creator gave the beaver its teeth to uh, knock down those trees to build dams. And if the beaver doesn't use its teeth, it grows too long. It actually curves inwards and pierces its own heart. And that's what we do today. If we're not honoring our gifts and practicing our gifts, our talents that the creator gave us, like we're killing ourselves spiritually. So it's good to practice every day and put down your tobacco and live a good life, to live an honorable life. I'm so grateful uh, that Derek is mentioning putting down tobacco and what that is, is an offering. So it's a way to show your gratitude for the day. So you might do a food offering. Maybe you say, well, I don't have access to a SEMA. The idea isn't just like, oh, here's some, here's some tobacco. I don't want any more, so I'm going to throw it on the ground. Give of your heart. You know, Give something that you value to show that you mean that you're grateful. So that's when, when you hear somebody off doing an offering in the morning to say, thank you for this day. 
Thank you for this, this breath that I have when I breathe in this morning, that I have access to water. A lot of people don't. A lot of beings don't. When you do your thank yous and you release that, that gratitude, those are the things that I recognize. I'd be interested in walking through the stages of rising if we've got a little time here. Do you have questions? Oh or gosh. Uh, rolling in? Yeah, so, so something about the uh, the allspice that you used in your recipe, how much were you using for, for that? Or is it just to taste or? Um, I always just go to taste, but I probably used about a teaspoon there, mm -hmm. maybe one and a half teaspoons. That's just, that's just a guess. Do you ever use it whole or do you just like to use it and like grind it or do you just use it like already ground up? Uh, it's best when you use it whole. It has obviously more flavor and you're starting to like release those when you use it into a mortar and pill. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Most it, people have access to the ground. So I just did something that would be accessible for everybody this recipe. Cool. We also had a question about uh, the trees and running sap. Do do all trees run sap at the same time or are they doing it at different times, different trees? Pretty much at the same time. Mm -hmm. It's when the ground is still frozen. So when the, um, it has to be like frozen at night and warm during the day. So the tree is gathering up all the water from the roots and all the minerals as it's waited all winter to start to pull the sap upwards to start to grow those buds to develop leaves. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it'll be different according to what the temperature is outside. So uh, sometimes you get an idea, like I tried to do a little range in my mind about like this year, uh, some of the differences. Lovely. Uh, yeah, I think that's all the questions that I've, we've caught up on. Yeah, do you wanna show us about the, sure. the process? So um, I wanted to show you this right here is, uh, and it's kind of hard to see, but if you could see it a little closer, this is the stock that you're going to look for if you're going to go out and look for wild rice. And wild rice will not put up with a lot of pollutants. So um, if it's if it you see something like this on a lake near you, and you can see where the rice kernels have fallen off, you know when you tap it in uh, the end of August, early September is usually when it's ready. And then those rice kernels will fall off. And this is what they look like when they fall off. So these are the rice kernels just falling off and now they're dry. So you can see it has a lot of like trickery, like little hairs on them. And you have to be careful of those hairs. Those hairs can be very itchy. I don't know if you ran into that. Did you see that when the dust goes up and your rice is sometimes like, ah, makes it itchy. But the, the little hairs too, they have backward barbs on them when they're fresh. So they might want to stick into your socks. A lot of people will use gloves or long sleeves. Don't forget your sunglasses. I've heard stories people get stuck in the eye with them. <laughs> I had a, a, a young one get a one in their ear and have to go get it removed. So that can be a challenge. But once you do is once you get it, you get it all like this, you've knocked it off. Of course, back in the day, you had to do a lot of forward thinking. You had to think about, I've got to make my G-mon. So your G-mon is your canoe. And of course, back in the day, you were going to use your birch bark and then cedar, white cedar, gunnels, and you're gonna do stitching and then you're gonna use um, uh, uh, spruce roots or tamarack roots to stitch up. And then if you split it, then you're gonna have to use some ash, sap, or not ash, white spruce sap, mix it with some hardwood ashes and some grease if you got it, like um, bear fat was the most abundant fat back in those days. And you can make a pitch that is like a, uh, almost like a shellac. So you're going to want to do that. You've got to have your canoe first. And then, of course, you got to make your knockers. So these are your wild rice knockers. Some, uh, some states, some tribes will say this is exactly how long it has to be. So um, you know if you get a license in Minnesota now, I think it's, uh, it's about, for me, I measure it like at least three to four inches longer than the length of my arm. So they're made out of white cedar. And they're very, very light because you might be out there a long time knocking. So these are your, your knockers that you're going to use to knock the rice. 
And then you're going to use a push pull. Now, here's me just modern day. This is my modern day push pull. And it's got a duck bill because now you're probably going to go into a very swampy, muddy area and push off your canoe. Now, for a real push pull, if we were, we were in like some heavy duty, the long stick might be a dried spruce um, or a dried balsam fir that you've used to put in your duck bill. Or back in the day, they would use the crotch of a tree and then use a peg, wooden pegs, to get it solid in there. So that would be your push pull. So that's how you would start to go out after the rice. Now, during the course of the year, you want to make your implements. Like this right here is called the new Scotch and Ogden, uh, a winnowing tray. So for me, it's harder now because the birch trees also are struggling with um, climate related diseases. So um, this is this was my one really good piece of birch um, that I was able to turn into a, a, a winnowing tray this year and then stitching it with the inner bark of the basswood tree. And then on the outside is the red willow, red willow hoops. Um, it's called red osier dogwood, bends really nicely. And then inside, you'll see, this is the rice that's been parched. So you have to parch it, which means you're gonna um, put it and make sure that the fire, the fire loosens the chaff. So you got to get all the papery chaff off, if that makes sense. Yeah, so usually this is like a big kettle. They put it like on the ground with the hole underneath it. And they put some uh, coals underneath it to make it really hot. You don't want to have a fire going underneath it because it can get too hot and puff up. It's like, you know, you can puff up your wild rice. So you just want to like nice, do it nice and slow and you're just stirring it, stirring it. And generally there'd be two people doing it, one stirring it. And one person down low by the pot, just picking, picking the stuff out, like some grass, the extra little stuff. And then we take it to the jigging station. Yeah. So that's called when you're stirring it with your canoe paddle or your stirring stick, it's called to gapizige. Um, so gapizige means you're heating it up and you're getting the chaff so it can come off. So, um, and some people nowadays, I've seen the, the chaff, like the little ends of the chaff, they'll make a tea out of it. And then you can, you can even purchase a tea out of that that helps, you know, um, helps food go through your body more easily. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so uh, you might see that in some of our native outlet stores of Manzan, they'll call it. That's like that tea that you can use out of the chaff of the, of the rice. I love that. I didn't know that. Yeah. Just, nothing goes to waste here. <laughs> nothing goes to waste. Then, of course, you can use the chaff itself if you want to put it back into your 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 garden. You know, for just like straw. Why not? You know, it, it'll turn nice and papery and and light. So after you parch it, now you're gonna dance on it. So these are my dancing on the rice moccasins, and you're gonna wanna moccasin is the Ojibwe word for shoe. Makizanug would be two of them. So here's, you want them high tops because uh, that can get into your socks, into your legs, and you're gonna wrap these long ties to make sure they're nice and tight and keep any of that stuff out of your, the prickeriness out of your, out of your pant legs, out of your shoes. And you don't want somebody big and heavy like me, like this guy, he's lighter than me. So we don't want to make rice flour. <laughs> We're going to get somebody lighter to try to loosen the chaff. So then you would have someone dance on the rice using their, their moccasins. Um, so these moccasins, I've never had them on the ground. They're always on the rice or put away. So if that's what you're going to use for dancing on the rice. Nowadays, most people would use a thresher or a mill that, that some people make their own that go around and loosen the chaff. But in the old days, you dig a pit and line it with deer, deer hide and dance on it. You <laughs> want to get a little, like the twist while you're doing that. And you can really be dancing for a long time, right? Oh. People will do it for hours uh, all day. <sighs> Yep. yep. Ah. Would that normally be a boy's job traditionally? Um, you would never want a woman that's or someone who's into womanhood. 
That's an important thing. Mm -hmm. So you just want a younger, a younger female or a real old, thinner female or a young man is the best. So once you get it like that, now you're gonna do your winnowing. So winnowing, I don't want to cause too much of the dust here, but what you're gonna do is you're gonna be getting the rice to go up. Can you see that? And that if there's a wind, it's gonna to start to blow the chaff away. And even in here, even though there's no wind, you can see that some of the chaff starts to congregate at the end and then the darker stuff goes to the front. So that's the heavier rice. So that's called Nuskachige. So I would say Niokea Nuskachige Yang, Niokea Nuskachige Yang. This is the way that you winnow the rice, Niokea. This is the way you winnow the rice. And this was, the winnowing was more of a woman's job, correct? Usually you see women do it, yeah. Or usually you would have seen women do it. So yeah, you'd see that like that. And then you can pack it away, you know, once it's, and you would sort the rice together too. Still nowadays, you'll see people with a big batch of rice. You'd go further than this and then start to pick out the ones that are um, still have chaff on them and say, rub them together. And then you'll see the rice appear. And then you can start to bag it up. When you see this, you go to any ricing sites, you'll see these white bags. And people will fill up these bags with the green wet rice. And they might want to say, oh, I'm going to, I need some Julia <laughs> or Mazaska. I'm going to earn a little money by, <laughs> you know, by selling my rice, right, when it's still wet and green. Well, when you look at it, like, whoa, hey, there goes some rice worms and some spiders. And uh, it's going to have water in there because it's still wet, right? So if you go to somebody who will purchase it to process it, um, to this year it was six to seven dollars per pound so that's why the prices are going to be high this year because anybody was getting if you were able to get some rice in your rice in bag then it was higher you know the amount that uh, people were, were having to pay because there wasn't very much rice available let's show this off a little... oh sure so people can kind of get an idea of what it looks like to do this. So this is a little demonstration of uh, wild rice being done and with the language included. So let me show you what how this works. Manoman is wild rice. To ike means to make and da means let's. So manoman ike da, let's make wild rice. So you can see the process here too. So they've collected Oh, maybe you got a hundred, maybe you got 300 pounds in your canoe. Holy cow, you're doing good. If you notice these beings, they're an otter and a duck. So this could be a human being that is from the duck clan. There is such a thing. Some people are like duck clan. This might be a human being that's in the otter clan. If you're of, if you're born to one of those two clans, you might appear as that animal. That's truly what you are. So when we did our introductions, he said he was a bear and I said I was a snapping turtle. So we might be appearing as humans or we might be appearing as these animals, an otter and a duck. So see how they've gathered this and now they're laying it out. Nowadays, people will usually lay it out on a tarp. And here goes Wajashk, Miao Jishib, Anidi Jishib, Nigig, Nigig is otter and the mallard duck. And here's Wajashk. Wajak, Wajashk is the muskrat. He's laying out that, and that's also a clan. Muskrat is laying out that rice so it'll dry. So now here we've got the, here's the boy duck, the male mallard, here's the female mallard, and she's winnowing. So you can see that she's new, she's new scotchage. That's the, she winnows, she winnows the rice. And here's, here's him again. He's gathered up that rice in his macuck. This is called the macuck right here. And then you'll see, oh, here goes Wawashgeshi is dancing on the rice. Wawashgeshi is deer. So this is how they do it. See how they have the poles 
and then he's dancing on the rice with those moccasins. Mia Al McKinnock. Mean. That's me. That's Derek. And he's parching the rice right there. So um, what you want to do while you're parching the rice, you're going to hear it. It'll start to crackle. And oh, boy, does it ever smell good. It has that good cereal smell. And that's how you know it's the stone. You hear that little ticking like a, like yeah. a watch. Yeah, that's it. You don't want to burn it because if it starts to burn, you can smell. Oh, uh oh, you won't want to ruin a whole batch of rice because you've had it on the fire too long. But yeah, there are materials if you're interested in this process. This is a good one put out by put out by Glyphwick, Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission. But for those of you who are really interested too, there's different things like uh, Rising with Tommy Sky. This is put out by Glyphwick. It tells the different processes about rising. And then Anishinaabe and the Nomen, the different, the different ways that rice was done back in the old days. So there's quite a bit of vocabulary, vocabulary that you can learn if you're interested in, interested in learning some of the different um, native languages. Pop up some water. Sure, let's do it. Right. It's gonna take a little bit. I want this scorching hot. So there's like three different ways that I know to pop wild rice. Ooh. You can deep fry it, you can shallow fry it, or you can just bring the pan to a really scorching heat Ooh. and throw it in there and it'll start to puff up. I like to bring it to a really hot heat without any oil. You do it with oil, it kind of has like leftover oily residue on it. Right, and it's not as healthy for you. Exactly. So this is gonna take a little while to the heat the, for the pan to heat up. Once you kind of start seeing smoke come off the pan or it's just scorching hot, then you'll know it's ready. Um, and you gotta be careful because you can burn this rice real easily. Once you start to see smoke come off the rice, it's ruined. Yeah, So um, I've done that. <laughs> I've happens. done it too. It's, it's a learning process. To, uh, you wanna take it on the heat, off the heat, keep it constantly agitated, making it move yeah so i love that he's trying to do it without using any fat because most of the time when i've seen people do this they'll use fat then the day you know so back in the day fat is really hard to come by in nature you, and this is the only time of year you're really going to get it so this is one of the reasons why you might go deer hunting or you might go bear hunting you would even use fish fat you know if you've ever seen fat accumulate in fish this time of year too so any kind of fat you can get this is when you're going to get it and that's why our bodies are designed to eat like our relatives did only 200 years ago it's not that long ago so we crave fat because we never used to get it nowadays you know you're only going to get it from a bear from a fish from a deer from maybe you'll have some raccoon fat or maybe you'll get some fat off of a muskrat maybe you get some fat off the skin that's absolutely true, but it's hard to come by. Another way is um, lipids off of uh, insects. So insects, exoskeletons would have fats in there. But nowadays we crave it because we just didn't get enough of it back when we were living closer to the earth. So for us to get fat now, fat was highly used and highly respected. So if you could get like bear fat, Holy cow, it's still one of the best gifts you can give an elder like myself, because you use it for everything. You probably wouldn't use it on your wild rice, just because there's so many other ways that you can fix wild rice. And nowadays, if you eat a lot of fat, you might end up showing it. <laughs> so you would say bimide, mukko bimide, that's bear fat. Yeah, so if you're using like, I would say bagano bimide would be a nut fat. So uh, different kinds of fat. If you've heard of John Bear Grease, that's his last name was Mucko Bimide. So that's what you're gonna hear. You're gonna hear that, that bimide for grease. Yeah, and puffing up wild rice, I think it would be a really cool experiment to try all these different rices and try puffing them up. All of them puff up completely differently. Some kind of don't really explode. Some just kind of, uh, I don't know, load up. I don't know how you describe it. Just kind of. You're welcome to, to try any of these. Which one do you think would be the best? This, oh, this man. one, the big green one. 
Yeah, that that's the one. Okay, so people get really particular about their rice. You know, if you say I'm from Bleach Lake, but I eat Net Lake rice. Ooh, oh no! So um, back in the day, people would say my mom is fry bread or my mom is rice. You know, so people are kind of uh, proud of how the rice is from their community. So it looks like I think we could try the yeah the Net Lake wild rice. Um, I know uh, that the tribe was reimbursing people who made uh, a percentage of their living off of the wild rice just because there wasn't wild rice up there this year. I know some areas there was rice, but not enough for people to make a living off of. So those things are kind of hard to hear, but it's just a reality of being in a new world of, of changing, changing climate. So yeah, if you're looking to buy wild rice like this, it's best to go to the reservation, mm -hmm. buy it from somebody that harvests himself. Otherwise, your best luck would be a co-op, like Seward Co-op or another surrounding co-op. Grocery stores don't really carry it. They mostly just carry the patty rice, mm -hmm. this dark rice right here. Otherwise, they have like a wild rice blend where it's several different types of wild rice. And, and sometimes mostly white rice yeah. with some wild rice put in. So this, this stuff's hard to come by. That's why it's so precious. And right. we try not to waste a single grain. Um, whenever we're cooking it, we, it's like one grain that falls on the floor. It's like, it's a no-no. We want to like use every grain and treat it all with like utmost respect. And like also keep the integrity of the rice. And we have teachings. I know one of the things I say to the youth at Dream Wild Health is don't ever throw food because we're showing that you don't value food and there will be a time when you want food and you won't have it. As you can see, it's getting hot enough. Uh, the pan is starting to smoke up a little bit and you can, hear, you can already hear the rice starting to dance a little bit. It's like a little ticking and it's dancing back and forth. So you don't want to overcrowd the pan because it's gonna, it's not gonna puff up properly. So we're just gonna keep this moving taking it up the heat. And you can start to see it's already puffing up, it's starting to pop and crackle. Yep, if you can see, it's already a much lighter color because a lot of them have already popped. Wow, I've never seen it done without oil before. This is nice. And it's, it's I'm gonna call it done right there. I don't wanna burn it or overdo it. That's, that's puffed. Beautiful. So I'm gonna put this in a bowl so you can kind of see the difference between mm -hmm. the beginning states and this final state. So if you are somebody who likes to experiment around with um, cooking, oh my gosh, anything you do with popcorn, anything you do with puffed rice, you can certainly use the wild rice as the ingredient instead of what you would use with popcorn. Say you wanna make caramel corn, you can make caramel wild rice. Mm -hmm. Maybe you wanna make um, rice pudding, you can certainly use anything, any of the wild rices and however your recipe might be. So that's what we started with. This is that Net Lake wild rice. Get a good look at it. It's not, it's not uh, getting that quality that I want, but get a good picture. And this is the puff wild rice, same exact rice. Oh dear, do you like to put salt on there or how do you like to prepare that once it's this puff wild rice? Yeah. I just like to eat it. Yeah. <laughs> I just eat it as is. Otherwise, you can like uh add it to like a trail mix. This is probably the best puff wild rice that I've had. This, wow. this puffs up really nicely. Oh. So as you can see, it's really puffed up a lot and it's really crunchy. Um now, when, when he showed that wild rice, um, to those of you who are ricers, you probably recognize that it looks like what we call the rice worms. And there are rice worms when you're picking wild rice. I know I, I was ricing with an elder friend of mine a few years back, and I said, gee, our rice looks like it's about a third worms and two thirds rice. Is that all right? And she said, all that means is you toast it up a little faster and it's gonna be a little bit greasier. Because remember those worms are all protein and rice. So don't worry about it. 
some good stuff. Yeah. So I like to add this like a trail mix wow. or use That's it as a garnish. Um, great on great on desserts. Mm. This is like tastes like popcorn a little bit, but it does has like the wild rice flavor to it. What a great thing for recipes for texture. Mm -hmm. I mean, and you didn't have to use very much of it at all to produce a fair amount. Oh yeah, no, for no, a no. textural change in your food. It, like well, this one, this one like almost like. Oh I'll say like quadrupled in size. Yeah. Normally, like it doubles in size. So we'll use some of this wild rice. Um, and I'll show you the difference. Um, this one's not going to puff up as nice as this. I'm going to do it the exact same way. Oh, we can compare the flavors too. Oh, that'd be yeah. fun. <laughs> can you do this in a cast iron pan? Yeah. Yeah, any pan will work. Cast iron, it might stick a little bit. Um, but, Watch how he does it. I, I was uh, really impressed by his technique because he was watching when it started to even just smoke a little bit. He took it off and kept shaking it. And that maybe that's the. And notice he's not going to leave anything in there to burn. Hey, Hope, quick question. How do you prepare high bush cranberries? You can eat them raw. They're always going to have a seed on the inside. So, one thing that's nice is to make a sauce or. Um, uh, you can make a, cran uh, a leather. Back in the day, they would make a leather out of it, you know, like a fruit leather. Um, it works really well for jams, but you can dry it like you can. Right now, I've got a bunch in my fridge, so I'm going to boil it down and then like it'll increase the amount of uh, uh, sugar in there by boiling it down. And I'm going to have to really make sure it doesn't burn, you know, same thing. And use it in any way that I would use a cranberry. But I'm going to have to get that little flat round seed out. It's completely flat. This, uh, the viburnum, the um, high bush cranberry, has a cousin that looks almost exactly like it. It's called wild raisin, only it's blue. And it's ready right now, too. So I'm going to do the same thing with that. The seed inside is perfectly round, perfectly flat. You can see that they're cousins, that they're in the same family. It's also a viburnum. So it's ready. It's often now this year, it's growing right next to the high bush cranberry. You do the same thing. You know, nanny berry, or it's also called nanny berry wild raisin. There's a few different names of it. Do you know what that cranberry can you eat seed like you would like a punch I'm, cherry or a hackberry that like pound it down? No, I wouldn't eat the seed. I've never heard of anyone eating the seeds of high bush cranberries. For the low bush cranberries, yeah, you eat the seeds, but not the high bush cranberries. Mm -hmm. Cool. Derek, can I ask you a quick question about allspice? Of course. When we're talking about allspice, is this the same as spice bush, the plant that has yellow <sighs> yellow leaves in the fall and grows near water? And the berries you can pick at different times for different flavors. Oh, that... I, can't, I can't answer that question. I don't know either. And I might have muddied that question because spice bush is the one I'm thinking of that's native to oh. the south and to the east. So I don't know. I don't know if it's the same. Mm -hmm. My bad. That's no. an interesting question. I, that's OK. That's something I'm going to look up when I get home. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious. Uh, do we know what kind of insects the rice worms are? Uh, Margo was Whoa. saying, as an ent entomologist, I'm interested to know. As much yeah. as people are not attracted to the idea of eating insects, they can add extra protein to your prepared they food. They certainly can. Mm -hmm. I do not know. That's a great one. I can tell you um, in the language, we have what they call um, rice birds. And I do know that those are rails. The, um, uh, there's different kinds of birds called rails in uh, Minnesota. So we've got like the black rail and oh gosh. Ah, well, I know that they're rails anyway. They're the diff a different kind of rail, it's the, the, the bird. And there is a certain kind of rice spider too that you always find in the rice, a real uh, leggy spider. Mm. So um, I do not know what scientific names of of those of the um, spider or the rice worm. I do know one time uh, I was way up north ricing with a dear elder friend and we stopped at a big spot where the rice was all mashed down and she goes, oh, this is a moose swallow. I said, a moose swallow? She goes, yep, the moose will come in here and they'll eat up the, the stalks of the rice and the rice itself and then they'll go under the water and they might be under the water. They can actually stay under the water, put their nose up, or take a breath, and huh. go back down. So they'll wallow in the 
and probably appreciate the water and the food when you get to the um, rice beds. And this year, again, the swans and the geese they needed food because, you know, whenever we have issues with food, they have issues too. So where we took the young ones ricing, they'd eaten the stalks, you know, before we could even get out to go ricing. So you could see where the geese and the swans had eaten the stalks and then gotten the rice and eaten it too. All right, so um, this is the wild rice that before it started. Ooh. And this is the puff wild rice. So this one did not uh, significantly like quadruple in size like the last one we did. This one probably just doubled in size. I'm trying to here's some of that. So could... Yeah, so it just kind of like doubled up. Um, here's like the comparison. As you can see, the one on the right, the Net Lake one, really puffed up, and uh, it would be interesting to see like what makes while the rice puff up, like whether it's the moisture in the rice or. That's a know, great like, question. I want to see the taste difference. Or whether it's the size of the grain, because that, that lake one is a lot larger in size. But taste the difference. This is, I like that. Yeah. Definitely a different flavor. I don't know, what do you uh, think? Uh, yeah, I mean, it is a little bit different flavor for sure. And that's interesting. I mean, gosh, you could really go down a um, a chefy a chefy road experimenting <laughs> around with these different flavors. This one's a little more cooked than that one. Yeah, that might be it. Yeah, this, I might have had this didn't burn, but it's like on the edge of burnt. Mm -hmm. It's like charred. That's good though. Yeah, no, it's it good. tastes really good. That's what I'm saying. You gotta be very careful when you're doing this because it'll just take off like that. As you saw, like. Once I put it in, it just started dancing. The kernel started moving all around. So it's a really fast process. So. For, for those who are interested in the rice worms, the way you say worm in the language is mousse. So um, mousse, we, we used to do a... <laughs> We, I remember years ago making a little children's book uh, in the language about the experiences of a rice worm. You know, like he goes on an adventure, <laughs> ends up in someone's canoe, and makes his way out when it, they're trying to, to roast the rice or parch the rice. So, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting to consider. I'm sure that they pupate into a, a, a flying insect, though. I'm pretty sure of that. I'm pretty sure that's the larval form. Is that a reason why it has Lou in the name? <laughs> Ooh, <laughing. laughs> good question. Ooh, we'll say, yeah, maybe. That, yeah, that's the word for poop. <laughs> I was thinking worms, you know, at the end of this. Yes, right? the end of <laughs> like, oh, look, there's something coming out of the worm. <laughs> Um, someone is wondering, does the rice need to be hand parched or will machine parched work? Machine parched will work. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of yeah. people actually started doing that because it is, takes so long to mm. go through this whole process, especially if you're doing it in a big batch. So mm -hmm. a lot of people go harvest the rice and then take it to a processing facility where they'll process the rice for them and they'll just pick it up. Yeah, makes sense. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. That's all the questions that I've got on here. Unless anyone else has any questions, you can put them in the chat for Derek and Hope. Is there anything else you all want to share before we wrap up for the evening? I hope you enjoyed the presentation tonight. I'm so thankful to Seward. Seward does such a good job and, and being responsive to the community. I know um, they do a, 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 a effort every year to make sure Dream Wild Health is being recognized. And right now they're recognizing also uh, Little Earth, the United Tribes, and they make sure that uh, funds go back to the Native community. I'm really grateful for that. I'm grateful for the organization that Derek works for, uh, Division of Indian Work and Dream Wild Health. Um, there's programs out there that we're doing our best to supply food and good food, healthy food to people and to raise consciousness of, of what's going on out there. I know me personally, I shop at Seward. <laughs> truly think about that for your own health, that in this country, we spend less on our food than almost in any other country in the world. 
because we're looking for cheap food. But really, when you think about it, you are what you eat. So make sure you get the healthiest food you can possibly get. And I, I always look for Seward to carry those. You can buy small quantities sometimes, but you look for that highest um, mark of away from genetically modified, away from highly processed, away from pesticides, herbicides, or ground that's so empty that there's nothing, no nutrition that comes back. One of the things we're, we talk about at Dream Wild Health a lot is that your nutritional value you get from a food, it has to match the biome that's in your gut. So think about that, where your plant is growing, that soil has to be healthy enough to match the healthy biome in your gut. So make sure that you think, think about where you're getting your food and express gratitude when you can get that, that good clean food. But thank you for letting us come into your lives today. I hope you learned something new. I'm really grateful to be with this guy right here. <laughs> um, if you have any questions, let us know. Yeah, thank you guys all for coming. Grateful for each one of you to be here. Grateful for Seward Co-op and providing the space and letting us share all this stuff, letting us have a voice. Most grateful for Hope for being such yeah. a good friend, elder, <laughs> teacher, and miigwech. Oh, I want one other thing. Some people think, oh, it's Thanksgiving time. That's why you're having native foods. Well, we have all kinds of reasons that we have feasts. So um, I know Derek knows about that. He's probably having feasts all the time at Dream at uh, Division of Indian Mark, where you know if you're getting a name, if you're getting a feather, if you have an outfit, um, if you're recognizing the sugar, the sugar trees are getting ready to give their gift. You're gonna have feasts. You're gonna have thank you feasts all the time. You know, if somebody gets a deer, like I remember one young lady got her first deer with a bow and arrow. So she had a big feast and a giveaway. And that's our old way is you don't get gifts. You give gifts when you're celebrating. So that might be a nice thing to kind of like, let's do that again. Let's have giveaways. Let's have feasts and recognize the goodness in each other and do this with honor and dignity. So thank you for listening. I hope you, you enjoyed this and I hope we have some good questions too.